Welcome to the Surviving BPD Relationship Breakups podcast with your host, AJ Mahari. This podcast will give you an in-depth understanding of borderline personality disorder, whether you have it or a loved one, partner, ex, friend, adult child, or sibling of someone with borderline personality disorder. AJ Mahari is a counselor and trauma recovery coach who has 30 years experience working with those surviving borderline personality relationship breakups in all relationship types, healing from codependency, inner child healing, family of origin healing, and self-differentiation, narcissistic abuse recovery, and much more. Keeping it real to help you heal. Abuse is not love. You can find this podcast at ajmahari.ca where you can also purchase and book sessions with A.J. Mahari. Please also subscribe to A.J. Mahari's YouTube channel at youtube.com slash A.J. Mahari. What is a trauma bond? And does trauma bonding or traumatic bonding imply addiction? And really, I'm going to present to you information here that says, no, trauma bonding isn't or traumatic bonding or a trauma bond isn't all about addiction at all are there aspects of something like that yes but is it addiction like somebody who has an alcohol addiction who's an alcoholic or a drug addict or a gambling addict no it's not an addiction like that at all so it's important that you understand what a trauma bond is because if you had a relationship with somebody with bpd or npd or you had a BPD or NPD parent, and you are likely a codependent, you need to understand why the relationship is so hard to leave and what's really happening for you, wherever you might be with this right now. And that the one answer to healing, breaking the trauma bond, surviving the BPD relationship breakup and recovering and recovering from codependency and finding out you know, who you really are and how to be the independent person that you haven't been able to be in your life because you've been codependent, that all requires therapy. There's no quick fixes, no mind hacks, no two steps, four steps, and 12 step programs. What we know about codependency today and trauma bonding, it's a waste of time to even look at 12 step programs unless you also have a co occurring with codependency, alcohol addiction or a drug addiction. Because aside from that, the trauma bond is not really driven as a, like in a sense of being addictive or an addiction as people think it is. What underlies and underpins traumatic bonding, trauma bonding, the trauma bond between people with codependency of relationship with somebody with BPD or NPD, and that could be also a parent, like I said, the underpinnings of that or adverse childhood experience, different wounding experiences, intermittent reinforcement, parentification, any kind of abuse in childhood, unmet childhood needs equals codependency. And codependency has its roots in childhood from trauma. And that trauma doesn't always have to be capital T trauma. Trauma bonding is also known as traumatic bonding. And what does that mean? Well, trauma bonds are emotional bonds with an individual that arise from a recurring cyclical pattern of abuse perpetuated by intermittent reinforcement through rewards and punishments. And where do we see this happening? And and for so many people is people will have codependency who are in or have been in relationship with somebody with borderline personality or narcissistic personality disorder. And and this is not limited to those situations, but that's what I focus on, as well as codependency, you know, BPD and NPD and codependency and trauma bonding and what happens in these relationships. It is the cyclical pattern of abuse perpetuated by intermittent reinforcement through rewards and punishments, right? It's the process of forming a trauma bond that it it really, what does that mean? Well, it's the result of ongoing cycles of abuse in which intermittent reinforcement of the reward and the punishment, just think about the borderline, the idealization, the split, the devaluation. You're the greatest today. You're horrible tomorrow. 
And it creates a powerful emotional bond. And these bonds are very resistant to change. A trauma bond usually involves a victim and a perpetrator in a unidirectional relationship where the victim forms an emotional bond with the perpetrator. This can also be conceptualized as a dominated dominator or an abused abuser dynamic. With people with codependency who are with somebody with BPD or NPD, a dominated dominator or an abused abuser dynamic, it's going to be, especially the untreated person with BPD, and it's going to be the narcissist that is the abuser. And the abused person is the codependent. So two main factors are involved in the establishment of a trauma bond, a power imbalance, and intermittent reinforcement of good and bad treatment or reward and punishment or idealization and devaluation. Trauma bonding can occur in the realms of romantic relationships, parent-child relationships, incestuous relationships, cults, hostage situations, and all kinds of other situations. By the way, one thing is important to say at this point is that trauma bonds between people with codependency and, and untreated but people with BPD or narcissists, this trauma bonding that happens has nothing to do with addiction. Nothing to do with addiction in the absence of alcoholism or a drug addiction or a gambling addiction. So for some people with codependency, they may have a love addiction or sex addiction as well as they may have you, you know, some people with codependency are alcoholics, some are drug addicts. So these are components of addictions that are not the underpinning reason for a trauma bond. Even if you grew up and your codependency ostensibly has a core to it because you grew up with an alcoholic parent or two alcoholic parents like I did, both of them narcissists with comorbidities, or if you had in your family of origin a drug addict, a gambling addict, this causes codependency often. It's part of the root cause. can be in many people's cases. But it's still not the reason that you trauma bond to a parent or to parents. As I know this and have come to realize this, not only through my own recovery and healing journey over 33 years ago now, but working with clients for 31 years. What I really know from my own lived experience, though, as well as other avenues of knowledge and awareness about this, is that what underpins any addiction in a parent or in, in a partner or whatever the case may be, or in yourself for that matter, what underpins that in codependency and the trauma bond is what isn't available, is what you experience. Whether you experience it because somebody has one of those three addictions, or you you have one of those addictions, whether you experience a trauma bond because of that or not, it's, it's not that. What I'm here to say is it's not because of that, actually. People who are alcoholic, actively, drug addicts or gambling addicts are not emotionally available. So what I'm trying to say here is, whether it be from somebody with an addiction in your childhood, a parent, or that's happening in your relationship right now, you have codependency and it's not just based on if you had an alcoholic parent. It's more to the point, the underpinning underneath, which is that you didn't get your needs met. They weren't emotionally available. So compare that or put that beside a parent that might not be an alcoholic, a gambling addict, or a drug addict, but they're just not emotionally available anyway. See what I'm saying? You take the addiction out of it, and you still have a trauma bond. So whether it's an whether it's somebody with an addiction, like your parent or whatever, it, it, that's not the reason for the trauma bond. It's the emotional unavailability and the results of that, perhaps one could say. But then how about all the other people who develop codependency without alcoholism or drug addiction or gambling addiction in their family of origin. Because so what I'm saying is it's the core emotional unavailability or parentification 
and the emotional incest involved in a lot of these relationships, which is the parentification in your childhood, creating codependency is not really just the addiction. And one can say, well, it flows right from that and therefore, but no, trauma bonds are about the emotional unavailability of a parent in your childhood and your unmet needs, regardless of the reason for the emotional unavailability, because that cuts across a whole lot of reasons why somebody with codependency has codependency and had, to one degree or another, an emotionally unavailable parent. The core shame, the toxic guilt, the incredible woundedness to the inner child for the person who develops codependency and all kinds of different circumstances of emotional unavailability from a parent leaves you trained and inculcated. In other words, to meet your needs. And the younger you are as a child, the more you need those needs met. To meet your needs, you end up enabling. You end up caretaking. You end up trying to rescue and fix them. This is the externalized out repetition compulsion cycle in codependency. And what lands people in relationships with borderlines and narcissists in an unconscious way, because you were never trying to help rescue or fix the parent for them. It was for you. It was for what you needed. And I say that from lived experience and having realized that many years ago in my own healing recovery journey, that, that it was two things really. It was primarily what I just said. It was, I was trying to fix rescue. I mean, at a young age, I'm giving my parents advice about why they need to go to the doctor and they're not listening and, and bad things happen because I wasn't wrong, even though I was just a kid, was common sense. And I'm like, you know, so I'd be begging them to go do this and begging them to do that. But was it just because they were alcoholic or cluster B even? Well, cluster B is a huge thing in it. But basically it was just that they were, wherever they were, they just weren't available. They couldn't hear me. They couldn't see me. They weren't giving me what I needed and I couldn't help fix, change or rescue them so that I could get what I needed. Because the pattern of codependency that starts in childhood and that people misconstrue it then in adulthood in these relationships with cluster bees, it was never about you wanting to enable, fix, rescue, change the parent. Like, like it's not even about that with the borderline of the narcissist. It's you not knowing you well enough, you being re-traumatized in adulthood with a BPD or an NPD. It's your, this is the inner child woundedness. And so people with codependency are never giving, rescuing, trying to fix, if you're enabling. All of that doesn't speak to an addiction in these relationships, in the trauma bonds because you're trying to get your needs met. So you're trying to get something back. And I'm not saying it's like you think to yourself, I'm going to do ABC to try to get DEF, right? It, it's not like that. But the broken mutuality and the mystified love, mystified love, which I'm gonna have courses and more coming on all of this, but mystified love in and of itself doesn't mean this exactly. It's part of. But mystified love means, along with the broken mutuality, there is, not just because of what that means, but there is, for people with codependency, for some people with BPD as well, probably narcissists, but they're not paying attention. They don't know. They don't care. What mystified love is really referring to is that it isn't really love. And of course, it's a trauma bond, right? Often with a parent, often then with a BPD or narcissist in your adulthood in relationships or a relationship. But what it's really about is the fusing together of abuse with the idea that that's love. So when you grow up in a home where you're either abused or, you, you know, the, the emotional unavailability of a parent or parents, based on whatever the reason is, forms a trauma bond, which is about intermittent reinforcement and has other moving pieces to it and gets really entrenched and is really toxic and unhealthy. Children learn what they live. When you're learning this in your childhood, you know, it's just unconscious, but it there's a fusing of the way that you're being treated, the way your needs aren't being met, to maybe you're being absolutely abused in many different ways 
then that to a child it's like any attention that whether it meets a need or not becomes like associated with love or like my parent or parents must love me because and in a lack and I grew up with this lived experience with BPD, NPD, mother, and dark shed father, and there was no love. But when we're kids, we don't understand that. And more to the point, like I would have to process in my healing recovery, like over 30, 35 years ago, this aspect of it, that my parents hated me because my parents wasn't about me. I was a kid. My parents hated me because they were incapable of love. So in the trauma bond, in childhood, to varying degrees, because not everybody with codependency has the same childhood experience or woundedness, then when you get with that cluster B in adulthood, which is almost destined to happen, by the way, it's the fusing of the idea, which is in the unconscious, right? The belief, the negative core belief, that the way you're being treated, which is oh so familiar to your wounded inner child, if you're not consciously aware of it, is love and that you're, quote, fighting for love, unquote, which is borderline or this narcissist. And let me just say, there's nothing healthy about that. It's mystified love. It's broken mutuality because love, healthy love, doesn't have to be fought for. But children learn what they live. And if you were always trying to get your needs met or often or even a period of time in your childhood enough to create codependency, then you have been taught or inculcated by that experience to not recognize that a, that the presence of abuse is the absence of love. And there's no love in these trauma bonds. In the abusive reality of unmet needs of what the trauma bond really is, intermittent reinforcement, I'm going to say it again, and dichotomous experiences, which in an overarching way, not referring to just BP, I could say, it's totally like a mean, sweet cycle. But make no mistake about it. When you're a child, and for whatever reason, the parent is emotionally unavailable, and it doesn't matter the reason. Is it alcoholism? Is it because they're a narcissist? Is it because something, there's a plethora of other things that can happen that isn't even really the parent's responsibility or fault. So when they're emotionally unavailable, this creates codependency. This creates in childhood for people that develop codependency, a trauma bond to a parent or parents. Trauma bonds in childhood in family of origin, another big piece of what I help clients look at and understand so that you can heal part of this process so that you know understanding this so you can heal is also very much about increasing your emotional literacy raising your emotional intelligence it's a going back within to the wounded inner child for many reasons but it's to bring to consciousness what i'm kind of describing here what i know that i went through in my childhood and what the trauma bond really was like with each if i had a trauma bond i'm not sure if i had one with my father well, i guess it was because there was nothing healthy about it this careful delineation based on what how trauma bonds and tra traumatic bonding is described by many professionals in a lot of literature that doesn't necessarily talk about codependency but it all fits together it just isn't and i keep repeating this it just isn't the addiction because you don't get addicted to the parent and maybe you're not even so addicted you're not really so addicted to the borderline or the narcissist either as you might hear more about keep listening because it's what underpins that it's intermittent reinforcement what that does which i'm going to say more about soon this is really deep multi-layered multi-faceted work and again i'll say the only way through all of this family of origin work, the inner child healing, the codependency recovery, the surviving the BPD relationship breakup or a narcissistic relationship breakup, a breakup of the narcissist, you really need to let go of the idea that the trauma bond is an addiction. And to just state that from my own personal experience, I have a childhood that was riddled with narcissistic abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, you know, every type of abuse. So that wasn't necessarily all only because or related directly to the fact that my parents were, well, cluster Bs and alcoholics. 
but more to the point, I know in my healing and recovery, what was most important for me to understand was that it was their emotional unavailability. It was not being seen, not being heard. It was, in my case, being a scapegoat as well. But it's the emotional wounding and then pursuing, in the case of you know a child, when you're a child and where codependency develops, pursuing a parent as I tried to pursue mine. It's like you double down, you triple down, you, you ten times double down, so to speak, to try to get your needs met. And that is what forms this deeper and deeper and harder and harder to get out of trauma bond because it's what's wounding you is underneath whether there's addiction or not. And I say that as somebody who with my parents, what they were like, which I've worked all that through, um, with, with the cluster B aspects of them, the cluster B reality of them, each of them, and the fact that they were alcoholics. It's really just not really about all of that. I mean, of course, all of that matters, but the underpinning of the trauma bonded connection or lack of connection that I had with them was abuse and not having my needs met and their emotional unavailability. And so I just want to stress it one more time. You could have a parent that for some reason in your, your childhood, it created codependency for you, was emotionally unavailable, and it could have nothing to do with an addiction, like alcoholism, drug addiction, or a gambling addiction. It could have nothing to do with it. So how do we say, well, if, like me, you grew up with one, or in my case, two alcoholic parents who were cluster Bs, that that's the reason right there. It's all about addiction and what... No, it just isn't. So I would invite you to think about this in a more in-depth way, and again, I'm out here to work with you if you resonate with me to help you to parse this, delineate this in your own experience of your own family of origin and do a lot of this, you know, various different aspects of the work that is recovery from the BP relationship breakup and from one's codependency and family of origin issues and a whole lot more. And of course, you can go to ajmahara.ca if you're interested in purchasing and booking a session with me. Because what's really happening in childhood, if you have an alcoholic parent, gambling addicted parent, or drug addicted parent with that addiction, what's really happening that causes your codependency, if it's got to do with a parent with addictions, aside from all the other causative factors of codependency, it's really intermittent reinforcement at best but the unmet needs that that encompasses and that maybe when the parent who is an alcoholic is drunk, they are really bad, right? They're abusive. And then maybe when they're not drunk, they're giving you some niceness or a little bit of attention. They might not be meeting your needs, but so it's not so much their addiction, it's what results from their addiction, which is intermittent reinforcement, which is at the core of trauma-bonded relationships. Not the addiction itself, but if you will, the byproduct of a parent with alcoholism or a partner with BPD, NPD with alcoholism, drug addiction or gambling addiction, it's not the addiction that forms the trauma bond. It's the intermittent reinforcement, essentially, let me just put it this way, in an overarching way, of the mean sweet cycle of the good and the bad and the dichotomous experience with anyone with a substance abuse uh, addiction. It's going to give you this intermittent reinforcement that's going to cause you to you need the love of this person with who might have one of these three addictions i'm just talking about right here right now it's going to cause you to have unmet needs of the intermittent reinforcement and then you're going to you're going to need to strive for that love in childhood you're striving for it again in adulthood if you're codependent with a borderline or a narcissist and what does that really mean? Well, it means the intermittent reinforcement, the lack of love, the lack of emotional availability, the lack of the meeting of your needs, 
both as a child and then in a relationship in adulthood with a with a BPD or an NPD. It means that you bond more strongly, bond more deeply in a toxic trauma bond with somebody who's giving you this dichotomous experience of really good, sometimes, maybe hardly ever, really bad, maybe most of the time. It entrenches in you this deep emotional bond that's unhealthy. And what gets thrown into the mix of this is the quest for love and then believing that the quote good is that person loving you, whether it's a parent or a BPD partner, a narcissistic partner or ex. So it's really not the addiction. And if you yourself are an alcoholic, a gambling addict or a drug addict, it's the intermittent reinforcement that somebody will experience around you and that you may then experience from them. So just make no mistake about this. It's the what underpins alcoholism, drug addiction, or gambling addiction, the three, three major addictions. They're not the only ones, but that's what I'm going to focus on here and just using it as an example to really hammer home this idea to you that you, you, will, you will benefit from understanding. It's the intermittent reinforcement, the dichotomous experience, and the unmet needs that cause the trauma that form the trauma bond that make you seek and pursue even harder that unavailable person. It doesn't even matter if they're unavailable because of alcoholism, gambling addiction, or drug abuse. They could, they, they could not be an addict and be unavailable emotionally to you anyway. And the same core woundedness, the same trauma bond, unhealthy emotional bond, and then it becomes associated with not only the need for love and validation and being seen and heard, it becomes associated with that. So you double down, you triple down, you quadruple down, etc., 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 And it makes you seek and pursue more the unavailable person. Whether there's addiction, their addiction, or, you know, alcoholism, drug addiction, or gambling addiction, or whether that's involved or not, it's just another way that you end up with unmet needs and seeking them more and everything being more entrenched in the intermittent reinforcement, the dichotomy of the trauma bond. So it's not really that the trauma bond is based on addiction or is addictive to you. It's the behaviors, it's the unmet needs that really matter in all of this that have wounded you. So even with addiction of someone else, like if the person with BPD has substance abuse, is an alcoholic, because I was in that relationship with the BPD, NPD, alcoholic, right? But it's still not the pivotal aspect. It's not at the core of the trauma bond. And I hope that I'll go on to explain it, that in this episode. So I will have more coming on other types of addiction and more on this. But it's really important that you understand, because this has been talked about by so many different people, you know, may, maybe even written about in books. But the bottom line is there's a separation and a deeper understanding to learn and to delineate in your own experience of codependency when you've been in a relationship or you may still be with somebody with BP or NPD, when you're really in a lot of pain, what you need to know again is whether the alcoholic, the drug addict, or the gambling addict was someone in your family of origin or a parent, or it's you yourself that have developed these types of addiction. It doesn't go hand in hand with trauma bonding. It, it can in childhood in a way create, but it's not going hand in hand with trauma bonding because it's the trauma of the situation. If you have an alcoholic parent or two alcoholic parents or a gambling addicted parent or a um, drug addicted parent, it's the trauma that that causes that's at the root of codependency that is the reason, will be the reason why you end up in a relationship with somebody with BPD or NPD, and that will be an unconscious experience until it becomes, it comes to your conscious awareness, which people get lots of information on the internet nowadays. Then you have to go into therapy, and I'm out here to work with you if I resonate with you, 
to be able to really work at this. So, so this association between a trauma bond has all to do with addiction or addictions, yours or somebody else's, just isn't true. Because what is true about alcoholism, drug addiction, or gambling addiction is that they cause the person maybe with those addictions, but also others, they cause trauma. And it can be part of a cycle of abuse, financial abuse, physical abuse, financial abuse in the case of the um, gambling addict, physical abuse, psychological abuse with an alcoholic, with a drug addict. So it's the trauma based on the drama of the person or if you yourself have an addiction. So it's it, there's still trauma that underpins that. And so that's why I really want to bring this to people's attention as I do with clients I work with. It's a very multifaceted, multi-layered process of understanding family of origin work amongst many other moving pieces. But if you think that codependency and trauma bonds with people with BPD or NPD or a trauma bond with somebody else, um, even if they are an alcoholic or a drug addict, if you think that that trauma bond is about addiction, then you're not understanding deeply enough what a trauma bond really is and what really causes it. But there's many more cases of people who are codependent who get into these trauma bonds, who don't have alcoholism, don't have a drug addiction, and don't have a gambling addiction. And those things aren't predominant or present in a person with codependency who's going to trauma bond with a cluster B, then the trauma bond itself and this deep, emotional, toxic, unhealthy bond has nothing to do with addiction. And so with lots of people with codependency might experience some kind of love addiction, but that is not really either what's driving the trauma bond. And I will talk about alcoholism, drug addiction, sex addiction, and gambling addiction separately from this, if need be, if there's any interest, because that's not what underpins for the majority of people with codependency it's not what underpins the trauma bond with a person with BPD or NPD. And even when people have one of those five addictions, it still isn't the reason for the trauma bond by a long shot. So perhaps there's something to do with addiction that comes later, but again, it's not akin to being an alcoholic or having a drug addiction or a gambling addiction because in those cases, the person is abusing themselves. So there's no, the intermittent reinforcement is, is whether they can drink or take the drug or gamble or not. But there's no power imbalance. So it's really erroneous to say that a trauma bond is an addiction straight up because it isn't. And it's not comparable to drug abuse or to alcoholism, or to a gambling addiction. Trauma bonds are based on terror, domination, and unpredictability. So I don't think that the alcohol with the, al with, with the beer in their hands is being dominated and terrorized by the unpredictability of what it's going to be like to drink that, or the drug addict who's taking some known drug or somebody who's addicted to maybe even a psychiatric medication. If you have a true addiction, you're not going to be terrorized, dominated, and have unpredictability with that kind of addiction. Now, there's going to be some unpredictability in a gambling addiction, but again, terror and domination, I know. So the trauma bond between an abuser and a victim strengthens as it does strengthen and deepen. It leads to conflicting feelings of alarm, numbness, and grief that show up in a cyclical pattern. More often than not, victims in trauma bonds do not have agency and autonomy. That would be people with codependency. And yes, people with BPD have codependency. And I would, ad I would advocate strongly that the covert, vulnerable, fragile narcissist could have codependency, not the overt, grandiose narcissist. And then there are people who have codependency who don't have BPD or, or NPD. Trauma bonds 
which are also known as traumatic bonds, are emotional bonds of an individual that arise from a recurring cyclical pattern of abuse perpetuated by intermittent reinforcement. As I said, trauma bonds are formed in abused abuser or victim-victimizer dynamics. So for the purpose of people with codependency, these trauma bonds are formed with a person with BPD or a narcissist because you are the one who's going to be abused and you're going to be externalizing out in an unconscious way how you were abused or hurt or had adverse experience in childhood to a parent that may well have had a personality disorder, have suffered intergenerational trauma, and therefore not be emotionally available to you, neglect you, give you adverse experience, parentify you, you know, um, which is emotional incest, actually. So there's a lot of things that can happen in childhood that create codependency. And then going forward from that, so some, some people with codependency have a trauma bond with a parent in childhood. So then you meet a person with BPD and they are mirroring you, idealizing you, and through their own codependency with their BPD, they are people pleasing and it's all about you and you feel so validated, so seen, so heard, right? So when trauma bonds are formed in the victim-victimizer dynamics, right? The abused-abuser dynamics, the codependent can form a trauma bond with a person with PPD, untreated especially, in the presence of a perceived threat from the abuser or the conviction that the, the borderline, the abuser, will follow through with the threat or the perception. This is what happens in the beginning. How This is how the trauma bond is established between a codependent and a person with BP, usually untreated. The perception of some form of kindness or love from the borderline. So from the abuser in this case. Isolation from perspectives that do not serve to deepen the trauma bond and perceived lack of, a, of, of ability or capacity to leave the situation create this trauma bond. It's so difficult for people to imagine leaving the person with people. The first incident of abuse, so the first split at devaluation with a person with BPD, is often perceived by the codependent as an anomaly, right? As a one-off instance occurring at the beginning of seemingly healthy and positive relationship, an otherwise seemingly healthy and positive relationship. The first incident is often not very severe, and the expression or affection and care by the borderline following the incident pacifies the codependent and instills in you the belief that the abuse is not reoccurring, that what they just did they're never going to do again. But later, repeated instances of abuse of various different kinds and poor treatment and nothing coming back your way, no mutuality, no reciprocity, generate a cognitive shift in the codependent's mind, not in a conscious way, that preventing the abuse is in your power. That you can fix this person. You can change this person. You can just rationalize, reason with them. You can just use your logic, right? And they'll understand what you're saying. You can, you can talk to them about it and it'll be okay. Far from it. But by the time the inescapability of the cycles of borderline abuse become apparent to the codependent, the emotional trauma bond is already extremely strong. And there are two main factors that facilitate the formation and continuation of a trauma bond, which has within it a power imbalance and intermittent reinforcement. The power imbalance for a trauma bond to persist, it's necessary for a power differential to exist between the borderline and, and the codependent, or in this case, the abuser and the victim, such that the borderline or the abuser is in a position of power and authority, whereas the codependent is not. Now, in, the, in this trauma-bonded type of relationship, it's not exactly what I just said there, right? I want to just give you that framework. But it's more how you felt, how you felt 
and how you garnered self-esteem and self-worth amongst other things that people with codependency are lacking when the person with BPD first idealized, mirrored, and people pleased you, or you know, or some people call it love bombing. So you, but but then you start experiencing intermittent punishment from this person, right? So person with BPD and cheat is going to become the abuser and the dominator to the codependent because they are in a position of more power. Why? Because you have thought unbeknownst to you, right? You didn't know what was going on. And you think that they're this loving person who you first met and who you first fell in love with. And they don't do this consciously. Really, they don't. Maybe some narcissists do. People with BPD aren't that organized. But the sum total of the effect is that they get into the power position and you as a codependent end up in the victimized. You as the codependent end up in the victim role and you internalize the person with BPD's perception of themselves, which they project out onto you. And this may result in a tendency for the codependent to self-blame in situations of violence or verbal violence or emotional abuse, etc. That's perpetuated by the person with BPD. And it negatively impacts people with codependency every which way. But people with codependency are still in that in an unconscious way, in that state of, but the person that I first met, the person that I fell in love with, who I thought the borderline was, you're still trying to get back to that. It strengthens and deepens the trauma bond because you are getting more and more invested in trying to get that person back who they aren't, who they never were. And in doing so, you keep strengthening the trauma bond because you're just hanging on for like the next cycle of intermittent reinforcement and people with codependency often have a negative concept of self or self-appraisal and this can maximize emotional dependency on the person with BPD and not that they're all strong they have the same thing going on with their codependency but they also have BPD so the cyclical nature of this dependency and negative self-concept and that's going on for the person with BPD and the person with codependency and not necessarily to the same degree but it leads to the formation of a strong emotional bond from from codependent to borderline from victim to abuser and so the physical emotional and sexual abuse can be used to maintain the power differential and what's sexual abuse what am i talking about well you're not exactly being sexually abused but many men with many borderline women feel very sexually controlled. And even though it's enticing and it's intense and it's wonderful, many men that I've worked with clients express to me on a continual basis, different clients that is, that over the years, that they then feel like if they just don't feel like having sex one night or the fourth time in one night or whatever the case may be, then the person with BPD doesn't accept that. So they kind of use the hypersexuality, not intentionally, maybe not consciously, but that, that becomes a power differential right there for many, many with codependency, May, maybe many more men, but maybe some women too with borderline men. And so there's a dynamic in this trauma bond formation that's also maintained by the in interaction of the person with BPD's sense of won't really be a true sense of power, but the hypersexual woman might have a sense of power around that sexuality. And the codependent sense of powerless and subjugation, perhaps to the intensity of the splendid nature that I hear about quite often of what people think is the borderline's love, right? That that all this sex and physical intimacy is is and I'm not saying that people with BPD are doing is great. But I'm not saying that people with codependency, I mean, sorry, people with BPD are doing this consciously, but it doesn't matter because it's happening. And then what's the next aspect of how these trauma bonds um, really get laid down and then you, you can't get out of one? Well, and out of the relationship. Even if you get out of the relationship, you're not getting out of the trauma bond without going to therapy. Intermittent reinforcement is huge. 
And it really helps to maintain. It establishes and it maintains trauma bonds. And in trauma bonding, the person with BPD intermittently is going to be devaluing and, you know, maybe holding things in and being going, giving you silent treatment or whatever manifestation of BPD a person has. They, they might be raging at you. They might be hitting you. Uh, you know, all of these different kinds of abuse. And you, the codependent, the victim, whether it's physical abuse, verbal abuse, emotional, and or psychological abuse, this abuse is interdispersed with the positive behaviors of expression of love, affection, intense, incredible sex, showing kindness, giving you gifts maybe, but promising to never repeat the abuse cycle. You know, never repeat again what hurt you so much. Alternating and sporadic periods of good and bad treatment serve to intermittently reinforce the person with codependency. Because the good, as I've had so many clients explain it, the good is so good and the bad is so bad. Really strengthens the trauma bond. Because when it's so bad, you are looking for or waiting out to the intermittent reinforcement of when it's going to be so good again. And so maybe that stops happening, but then you still think it's going to happen at some point. And none of this has anything to do with addiction right now. It's all about trauma and this trauma bonding. So when you're waiting for that intermittent reinforcement, even if it's never coming again, but you don't know that, it can be elucidated upon by drawing from learning theory and the behaviorist perspective. In the presence of an adverse stimulus, reinforcement to rewards in unpredictable ways are a key component to learning. So there's more um, attention paid, more hypervigilance building as to what's going on with that person with BPD and where are they and what cycle, what phase of the cycle are they in? Whether you're aware of that or not, that happens. And some people become very aware of it. And when the learner, so the codependent, is unable to predict when they will get that intermittent, that really good, good, you know, intermittent reinforcement, then your learning and your attention is maximized. And your pursuit of said is maximized. And so the same with the intermittent expressions of affection and care are unexpected. And you have an inability, you might have some way to predict it with some people BPD, each, it's, it's different for everyone, but there really isn't an, there is an inability to predict when you're going to get that really, really, really good. And it makes you seek after that more and more in whatever that means that you have to do. I've had clients say, I just need to leave her alone for two days. I just need to leave her alone for two weeks or whatever the case is. And then they come back to, it. so however you learn whatever might work. And some people be here too unpredictable for, for that kind of pattern to be established. Intermittent reinforcement produces behavioral patterns that are extremely difficult to terminate. So they, so these are incredibly strong bonds, but they're trauma bonds. So they're toxic. They're unhealthy. They're not good for your physical or emotional health. And so the trauma bond is maintained by keeping the power imbalance and the intermittency of abuse intact. So you're, you know, you're going around the cycles of like, okay, this is awful. What's going on here? I don't know. I'm so confused. And you're getting hurt. But, but then after that, you know, the person with BPD probably calms down if they don't ghost or discard at that point. They calm down. Maybe they go away and ghost you. And then they come back. And maybe that's a pattern for some people with BPD. But the intermittency of when are you going to get the good back? That's what's really driving the maintenance of the trauma bond. And it's about dependency. And people with codependency tend to have a more congruent dependency, if that makes any sense, than people with BPD because they will come and go and, and they will, you know, maybe not re-idealize, but they're they will come back to base mood. They'll devalue again. So people with codependency get cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance theory can also explain the maintenance of a trauma bond. And this theory postulates that when individuals experience a conflict between their beliefs and action, they're motivated to make even more effort to reduce or eliminate the incongruency in an attempt to minimize the psychological discomfort arising from it. 
So people with codependency may distort their cognitions about the experience or, or however the borderline is treating you, or the abuse and the trauma of the relationship. You, you just may really be in a cognitive distorted way trying to hang on to the really good good when that's going to come back and you're minimizing how bad the bad is. And this is really about um, rationalizing the person with BPD's behavior, the abuse, the abuser's behavior, their justifications, and minimizing the impact of what they do to you, uh, and then blaming yourself for what they do to you. Because you think, well, I must have done something to cause that. Like, I got to make sure I don't do this, that, the other thing again. Don't say this. Don't be late. Don't. It's really um, an incredibly strong bond that's happening when the trauma bond is forming. And you might note at this point that I still haven't said anything about addiction because it's not about addiction. And people might say, well, you know, you're addicted to that mean sweet cycle. You're addicted to, you know, you put up with the, the, the horrible, the bad, the abuse because you're addicted to the sweet cycle. But that's still intermittent reinforcement. That's still a power imbalance from the person with BPD over the person with codependency. The person with BPD is going to be so often, you know, a la the Cartman drama triangle, the person with BPD is going to be so often in the persecutory role, the persecutor. And you're going to be, as a codependent, really in the rescuer role. And then what really happens in that triangle is that both of you become victims in different ways. It's a mess. It's a toxic soup. And once the once you have formed a trauma bond, it, well, it means you're codependent, by the way, but once you've formed that trauma bond with a cluster B, then it's, you need therapy to get out of it. You just, you do. And if you look at what authors of books say, or I think it's Patrick Carnes with the betrayal bond, if you look into this more deeply, you'll understand what I'm saying about the fact that if you've heard anyone else out there say, well, this is just all about addiction. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's about what happened to you in childhood that created codependency. And it's about what happened in the more primal trauma that people with BPD suffer and why their repetition compulsion cycles are so abusive. And why you get, you know, and why the good keeps diminishing and the bad keeps increasing. And why are codependents stuck there? And it's not the same for everybody with codependency but has a lot to do with your childhood, and it's not really something in your conscious mind. And so if and when the codependent finally decides to leave this relationship and you're trying to survive the BPD relationship breakup, the immediate relief from the traumatizing violence, whether that's physical, verbal, and or psychological, or just, just all kinds of different forms of abuse, will begin to abate when you, when you first leave, right? Begins to abate. And the underlying deep attachment formed as the result of intermittent reinforcement begins to resurface. So you're missing the good who they really never were. So in this current period of vulnerability after you've left the person, the relationship, and you're emotionally exhausted, and that exhaustion, the cognitive dissonance, the rumination, all of what you've been through will trigger the memories of when the borderline was temporarily affectionate or intermittently kind of kind and caring in some way to some degree and in the desire to receive that affection once more the person with codependency often will return or or maybe yes very quickly return recycle with the relationship strong social support can be a protective factor when it comes to preserving codependent functioning and providing a buffer in traumatic situations. But so many people with codependency don't turn to anyone else but the then BPD X or the on again, off again person with BPD. And so the, the, the trauma bond is an attachment bond, a very toxic, unhealthy attachment bond. And it's formed based on something, especially for people with BPD, uh, trauma bonds often in the 87% in their childhood with their main caregiver. And to a lesser degree, perhaps, that for people with codependency, but neither have secure attachment. And attachment styles, is it's a part of this, but it's not the reason. It's not how you get into this trauma bond. 
because you're just looking to attach and that in and of itself isn't really supposed to lead to the negativity that these relationships and the toxicity that these relationships lead to. The more that in childhood, so infancy to childhood, that people aren't getting the secure attachment that they're seeking, that, that we're hardwired to need in order to be healthy and to go forward in our lives without all of this trauma and trauma bonding. Even in situations where immediate caregivers are abusive, human infants still tend to attach to them because it's about biological survival. And rejection from a caregiver, so the abandonment, the rejection, only enhances the efforts to increase proximity to them. But as you keep, as a child or an infant will, just automatically keep trying to establish an attachment and a bond to that first caregiver because biological survival depends upon it. So the more the danger, right, because looking for reward but the more the danger in the relationship that you're going to be hurt, that you can't fix them, you can't rescue them, you the codependent can't do those things and you can't mitigate the danger. But the more the danger to you psychologically and or physically, but in so many ways, it, it, the more that danger increases or the pain increases, you, what you're experiencing is highly negative, the bad, super, the super bad increases the more you're going to seek increased attachment. And that isn't wholly anything to do with chemical, the chemicals inside of our body, with the, but it has all to do with the core wounds of childhood. And when ordinary pathways of attachment are unavailable, people tend to turn back to an abusive parent, a neglectful parent, and in the case of codependence in adulthood, in a romantic, a significant other relationship with somebody with BPD, turn back to that person. And it leads to the, to the development of a strong bond and a deep emotional connection, that's the trauma bond, with the abuser. And this attachment is both to abusive caregivers in infancy or neglectful parents and being parentified and various other things in childhood. And it, it's, an, it, it's adaptive even for people with BPD when they go through what they go through in childhood. People with codependency, it's adaptive in the short run and it aids in survival. But in the long run, as you get older, this attachment is maladaptive and can lay the foundation. It increases vulnerability to this trauma bond that you don't realize that you're strongly into. Maybe you get really deep into before you start trying to learn anything about all this stuff. Unhealthy, toxic, or traumatic bonding occurs between people in an abusive relationship. So there's no love. The bond is stronger for people who have grown up in an abusive household because it seems to them to be a normal part of relationships. So this is really true for a lot of people in the 87% who have BPD if they're untreated. And it's very true for codependents as well. And it's not always the same exact situation you go through in childhood. But there is something there that creates a codependency. Different for many, diff uh, different for many people only so many patterns and reasons though for why people have codependency i just want to reiterate that at this point i haven't mentioned anything about addiction because it's not about addiction all of what i've said so far <clears throat> it is codependent externalization out of repetition compulsion cycles that began in childhood and it is in a different way for different reasons the same thing for the person with bpd and there and again lies an overlap between codependency and BPD, though I'm not saying they're the same. And what happens to people with codependency with untreated people with BPD in these toxic trauma bonds is that gradually you develop a sense of trust and safety, especially in the idealization phase, albeit skewed, but unbeknownst to you, you develop this towards the person with BPD, who you think they are. And then suddenly, or at some point, you realize they're not who you thought they were, or what is that about? Then, then the conundrum and the pain and the devastation rises. So trauma bonding can be coercive. It isn't really in the case between um, codependents and people with BPD, because each are seeking not such different things from other, but in many different ways and for some different reasons. But there's overlap. 
Because the other thing about the trauma bond connection between a codependent, you might not know you have codependency till after the relationship, but this connection of the trauma bond between people with codependency, people with BPD, and or even people with NPD, but I'm going to focus on BPD here, is that you are meeting them in an unconscious way unbeknownst to either of you in the beginning of the relationship. Codependent, both the codependent and the borderline, are meeting each other at, at so, so you're too, you know, in, in, intellectually and physically, you're two adults who are attracted to each other and all that's going on. What's going on in the unconscious, though, is this pull. In the part of the borderline, it might be like the absence of a self, but there's a woundedness there. There's a lost self, so still sort of an inner child dynamic. And for the codependent, it's going to be a wounded inner child. And there's this pull of familiarity. You connect on a deeper level in an unconscious way, the borderline and the codependent both, connecting the trauma bond because you're connecting from your core woundedness each of you but nobody knows that consciously at the time so people with bpd have what's called disorganized attachment style which is really kind of just <clears throat> not any attachment is the best way to put it until unless they get a lot of treatment successfully in therapy and people with codependency usually more often than not do not develop uh, a secure attachment. So there's an insecure attachment, no matter what the different various attachment styles are, which is important to look at in therapy, in recovery. But it's not the reason to say, oh, I just have to do something about my anxious avoidant attachment. And the person with BPD, I think they're just ambivalent, whatever attachment style, but it's disorganized, not that. All we have to do is fix that and everything will be okay. No, Nothing can be further th from the truth, and you're already trauma bonded. And the quote fix involves people with codependency getting their own therapy for healing and recovery, and the person with BPD going their own way to do their work, which takes a lot of time, like years, 8 to 16 years, if they get into uh, psychodynamic therapy. So they can start with DBT, has efficacy, helps people a lot with BPD, but it's not going to help. It helps them change behavior, but it doesn't change the emotional landscape, which psychodynamic therapy does that, does both actually. Changes the inside and changes the behavior. So overall, a trauma bond develops. In childhood, the child's sense of self is derived from their emotional dependence on the parent or parents. And so this is what's being, this is part of the externalized repetition compulsion cycles of codependence, is that that person with BPD and who you thought they were more to the point is the trauma bond is developing because you're now deriving a sense of self from the emotional dependence on the person with BPD. Just as a person with BPD and for other reasons and, and other types of trauma, deeper, more primal trauma is doing that with you. And you become what's known as object other to them and they don't know the difference. They don't have a self. They don't have a cohesive or a sense of self, a cohesive sense of self, or any self-coherence about self. And so they can't tell the difference between self and other. And that's why they don't have boundaries. And that's why when you disagree with them, they can really have, you know, a difficult time with that. And then you're going to have that really bad experience. Because when you, when you don't agree with them, they seek to be getting identity, their identity from you. So what are the outcomes of these trauma bonds? Well... They have several short-term and long-term impacts on people with codependency and also on people with BPD, but it can force people to stay, the codependent for sure, in, and maybe some people with BPD, can force people to stay in the abusive relationship. It perpetuates transgenerational cycles of abuse because why you have codependency and a person has BPD and you get together with them and for people that have children together, unfortunately, there's going to be the passing on of at least some degree of transgenerational -gen cycles of abuse and trauma, trans intergenerational trauma. And the, and the results, adverse mental health um, outcomes and anxiety and depression and feeling, with people with codependency, feeling like you don't know who you are anymore because it can get um, confusing. 
So there can be neuropsychological difficulties encountered from being from the experience of being in a trauma bond. Um, so it can have adverse neurobiological and neurophysiological outcomes. Doesn't mean that that has to be forever, but they need to be really healed. And that's another reason why you really need therapy. Not the body of the victim, so the body of the codependent in, from the trauma bond is in a perpetual flight, bite, freeze, or fawn response or state, which can increase cortisol levels, the stress hormone, and can have a cascading effect and trigger other hormones. Persistent chronic stress can also hamper the cellular, can hamper the cellular response in the body, thereby negatively impacting immunity, organ health, mood, energy levels, and more. So in the long run, this can cause epigenetic changes. And in 2015, in a study, it was found the establishment of a trauma bond, especially in infancy, is linked with amygdala dysfunction, neural behavioral deficits, increased vulnerability to psychiatric disorders. Yeah, like BPD. But the point is, even with that, trauma impacts the brain, the dysfunction in the amygdala can be corrected in a psychodynamic mo modality of treatment if people with BPD will stick with it. People with codependency are unlikely to have because your, your establishment of a trauma bond likely didn't happen at, in infancy. It was likely later in, in your childhood. So there are adverse mental health outcomes to trauma bonds. Trauma bonding is linked to several adverse mental health and well-being outcomes, and codependency is one of them, and so is BPD, and so is NPD, and so is CPTSD, and there are many, PTSD. And as a result of the abuse itself and the emotional dependence that actually borderlines have on the codependent, codependents have on the borderline, but not maybe for the same reasons exactly, but similar, it, it just wipes out whatever kind of self, you know, esteem, self-image, self-worth that you had. And the psychological abuse incurred by people with codependency, as has been incurred by people with BPD often in their childhood, 87%, is far more dangerous than the physical abuse. Because what happens is you interject all the negative things, the, the terrible things that are spewed at you by somebody with BPD, if you're codependent, you are, you know, unconscious, in an unconscious way, interjecting those as you have interjects from your childhood with your parents, which are based on injunctions and or family of origin rules, which are unspoken rules. But these injunctions and these interjections of the negative variety just inflame your internal inner critic, let alone what it does to your inner child that's already wounded from childhood in these relationships when you're an adult. So people can end up turning on themselves with codependency and or BPD after relationship breakups. It's like, you know, how could I have been such a fool? You know, I was such an idiot. Uh, it would be really critical self-talk that's not helpful. And this further contributes to a negative self-image and it maintains low self-esteem, low self-worth, or a lack of either. And they both foster a poor self-concept. So so people with codependency are losing themselves more in the trauma bond connection with a person with BPD. Trauma bonding can also lead to dissociative symptoms. That's for people with BPD or to a lesser degree, people with codependency. That could be a self-preservation and or coping mechanism. Neurobiological changes can also affect brain development and hamper learning. That's in childhood, but that also can be changed when people get into therapy with for codependency recovery and BPD recovery, either or, like for the person with BPD, it's both. And I think this is why we might see so many more people with codependency, because it starts in childhood, don't forget, being diagnosed with ADHD and or um, learning difficulties. The internalization of the psychological manipulation and trauma gives rise to anxiety and in the increase with anxiety, the increased unlikelihood of engagement in risk-taking behaviors rises too. And that's for people with codependency. We know that's for people with BP as well. And the isolation involved in trauma bonding can foster a generally skewed sense of trust 
making a codependent vulnerable to situations that may re-traumatize or re-victimize them with the person with BPD. People with BPD do that with narcissists as well, but not in a conscious way either. And codependents may also tend to either completely dismiss or minimize dangerous, damaging behaviors, psychological, you know, raging violence, people throwing stuff around you, the person with BPD, you just minimize it. Like, well, you know, it's kind of like what they do. And if I, I, if I want to get the good again, that intermittent reinforcement, these are cycles of abuse in a trauma bond relationship. It's not an addiction factor. So trauma bonds are really not defined by or predicated upon any addiction. And as I say that, though, it's really important to note that by the time you've been through a lot of this and you've lost yourself, then you will be in a situation where you've lost yourself. You need to really understand what was that hook that got you into the relationship in the first place because it had something to do with something you needed from childhood as a codependent. So what happens in the trauma bond? It's, it's not really an addiction. It's described as being like an addiction. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about love addiction or sex addiction here because they can be part of codependency or not. They're not one and the same thing. The, the, the effect on neurobiology, which can be healed and recovered from, it's the intermittent reinforcement that drives like the fight, flight, freeze or fawn response. And when that's happening a lot, it's putting a lot of stress on the HPA access. And that means you're going to be a lot more stressed. And then in the good cycle, you're going to get this release of dopamine, which feels fantastic. Maybe some oxytocin. And then, you know, they, they crash. They, they, their mood changes. They're triggered to devaluation again. And then you go from that dopamine high of it was so good right into the cortisol stress hormone and and those are not the only you know neurotransmitters and hormones and and involved in the endocrinology of all this but that involving endocrinology is predicated first and foremost by trauma and the trauma bond itself and then can it feel like an addiction do people who leave the borderline feel like they are in withdrawal? Yes. But, but is that literally what it is? In a way, inside your system with the neurotransmitters and the hormones. But that will, if you go full no contact, that's something that will start to fade. So within a month, two, three months, it gets much better if you don't re-engage with the BPDX. But the thing is, that's because you're overactive at that point. Codependents have an overactive amygdala. You have an overactive hip hippocampus. The endocrinology in your, of your system, the neurotransmitters and the hormones that are being released and that have been released, and then you start ruminating and thinking about the good times. When you're thinking about the good times, you're going to get a, a little bit more dopamine release again or oxytocin or both. And then you're going to be in the cognitive dissonance. And then you're going to remember something that was really painful, devastating, tra traumatizing, and horrific. And then, you know, so your body is going to react with more cortisol and other, you know, stress hormones and things that aren't positive to feel. It's really the way that people are stuck in the psychology the emotional reality of this really strong trauma bond that really is what the trauma bond is is why the trauma bond is hard to break is why you need therapy and so it really isn't an addiction traumatic bonding i i did a little research i looked into this and nowhere is it associated in psychology or psychiatry with addiction. So there's an aspect of what is like an addiction with the chemical soup in the body's own system and the intermittent reinforcement. But it is the trauma, the adverse child experience, the, the unmet needs of a person with codependency that drives that want to pursue who you thought they were, that will drive which 
hormones or what's being released in your endocrine system. So that what comes first is the trauma bond based on trauma for both the person with BPD and codependency. What comes second is what's happening to you in a physiological way where the HPA access is working overtime in people with BPD and codependency with the four F's response in the amygdala. It's freeze, fight, flight, or fawn. And when that's going off all the time or often or like multiple times a day, even if you're out of the relationship with the borderline, you haven't broken the trauma bond. And when you feel like you're in withdrawal, there's an element of withdrawal because of your endocrinology and because of the trauma that you've experienced. And so it takes time for that to settle down. And, and then it's interfered with by recycling, more contact, ruminating, looking at their social media, wondering what they're doing, trying to figure out what they did. <clears throat> if, you're, if you don't get into therapy and if you're focusing too much on them and only videos about BPD, etc., then you're still negating and abandoning yourself. And that's going to keep you out of balance. And, and so you're going to continue to have this fight, bite, freeze, or fawn responses, or, or one or two or three, or whatever, that you're experiencing happening. And that's going to keep driving your endocrine system with these hormones and neurotransmitters. So it is trauma at the base of it all. And so when people break up, and when you're trying to survive the BP relationship breakup, you need to have the no contact. You need to have the time. But you need to get in therapy first. And then you need to get have the time and working in therapy to understand what's really happening for you and why you're feeling what you're feeling and how to break that down and how to learn more and how to increase your emotional literacy and how to get in touch with your emotions and family abortion work and looking at the inner child, healing the wounded inner child, all of these things and more are so important because the trauma bond is a psychological, emotional bond that is traumatizing, as I've laid out here in, in this episode of this podcast. And I'll have more coming on this about what's really going on in the reality of your endocrine system or uh, physiologically for you. But what we do know is if you can go full no contact or at least get in therapy to work on that, work it all through, understand more about how you develop codependency in the first place, all of this and coping mechanisms and skills to deal with the rumination, how to interrupt that, how to stop the focus on the person with BPD, how to stop feeding this system, your HPA access and the endocrinology so maybe somewhat the neurobiology of your system. The more you th because there's so many things that people with codependency are doing after the BPD relationship breakup. The cognitive dissonance, the rumination, the wanting them back, the missing them because it's a loss too. But they're really missing who you thought they were. It's trauma bond and traumatic bonding. For those of us that know what we're talking about and have done the research, it is not an addiction. And the addiction factor comes secondarily, but it's still not really addiction proper. It's not like an alcoholic with an addiction to alcohol. It's not like a drug addict with an addiction to a drug. It's not, well, it's not the same as, it's, it's sometimes said it's like that, but it's not the same as, and it's not the same as a gambling addiction. Because this is something that has been driven by what you experienced in childhood that ca created, caused the codependency for you in the first place, which is the reason why you end up with a cluster B in the second place. And thirdly, to be able to heal and recover and survive the BPD relationship breakup and heal and recover from codependency, you need to get into therapy because it's multi-layered, multi-faceted process of healing and recovery. And the first part of that is calming the HPA access down to stop what your thoughts, your rumination, your longing, your wanting, your unmet needs are driving you to continue to think about the cognitive dissonance, the pain. It's devastatingly painful. But all that's happening 
when you feel that withdrawal is you you know it's what you're thinking about it's what you're focused on it's it's unmet needs it's still trauma that's driving the reaction you know physiologically in your body so it still isn't really an addiction it feels like that i have described it like it's like an addiction but it's not the same as an addiction to alcohol drugs or gambling it's really important you know that and when when talking about codependency i have to adapt some of what i'm actually reading what i have read what i'm researching into my understanding of codependency which is also informed by some pioneering work of a psychiatrist who proposed in 1986 codependency be called codependent personality disorder and be put in the APA pseudoscience nonsense uh, quote Bible unquote DSM um, Bible of Psychiatry and the only reason the, the, the main reason why codependent personality disorder never came about through the APA and in their Bible of Psychiatry the DSM is because they determine that codependency overlaps too strongly with BPD and cluster B and too strongly with dependent personality and cluster C. So you see, I think a lot of people are out there trying to survive the BPD relationship breakup in the trauma bond reality of all this, hearing from other people that it's all an addiction. No, it's not. It's all trauma. And then that has an effect on your endocrine system, your neurobiology, the hormones and the neurotransmitters, that's why you need therapy. Not 12-step groups, not, you know, just meditating. It's really hard for people to meditate at first. That can help later. But you need to learn pattern interruption for what keeps driving your already inflamed HPA access. So I hope that you could hear what I've said here. Because, yes, what does it feel like for codependent after BPD relationship breakup? It feels like you're withdrawing from them. And there is some reality to that, but it still is not substantiated, you know, in a sense that we can actually accurately, with, with, with education and knowledge, say that that withdrawal that you're feeling is because you became addicted to that person. No, you became deeply, emotionally traumatically bonded to the borderline or if it happened to be a narcissist or if you're the adult child of a narcissist or a borderline and then you got in a relationship with one of them and this is why i keep asserting that traumatic bonding trauma bonds between codependents and people with bpd or npd are not addiction and should not it's reductionist simplistic and simply amateur for someone to say that a trauma bond is like the addiction of alcoholism or drug addiction. It simply isn't. And I hope that's helpful. And I know that what I'm saying, if you're in the middle of all this, you're going to be feeling like, well, I don't, I don't know if I care because like, I feel like I'm in withdrawal. Well, you are. But it's not a withdrawal from an addiction. It's a withdrawal from what your system is doing because of what you're thinking and what you're feeling and the deep emotional trauma bond. So I hope that was helpful and look for more coming real soon. Take care. You've been listening to the Surviving BPD Relationship Breakups podcast with counselor and trauma recovery coach, AJ Mahari, keeping it real to help you heal. Abuse is not love. You can find this podcast website with blogs and more information and purchase some book sessions with A.J. Mahari at ajmahari.ca to help you with your healing and recovery journey from any relationship type with somebody with borderline personality. Please also check A.J.'s other website, bpdbreakups.com, for blog posts and more information. A.J.'s membership site can be found at ajmahari.co. Please keep tuning in. And if you're not subscribed to AJ Mahari's YouTube channel, please check it out at youtube.com slash AJ Mahari.